You clearly see the inflationary pressures. We've heard the, the, the narrative from pretty much any policymaker that you speak to that is transitory. Data from multiple sources point to these lasting longer than most initially thought. And by this definition then, the forces are not transitory. My baseline case um, is, is not for stagflation over a you know, medium run horizon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Inflation risks in the frame. U.S. CPI is due today. The Atlanta Fed president, of course, uh, brings out the swear jar and says transitory is a dirty word. Chip crunch bites Apple. The company is likely to slash its iPhone production target on the processor shortage. And Bill Winters exclusive, the Standard Charger chief executive, does not pull any punches and tells us China is not dumb enough for a Lehman moment. More on our conversation throughout this hour. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. A lot of the focus, of course, is on earnings. Yes, we're there. It's that time of year again. The focus is on earnings. We had LVMH giving an impetus for some of the industries, and you can see for the moment they're unchanged. So if we delve deeper, and this gives us a great indication, actually, of where we are on the FTSE. Again, very commodity rich, so we look for margin pressures because of energy prices rising. The CAC 40 down some 0.2%. Again, it's very luxury rich, so LVMH yesterday giving an impetus that things are not too bad. Yes, growth is slowing, but actually they're still holding on to some of the growth overall, despite the concerns we have in China and the DAX getting some 0.3%. Remember, today is also JP Morgan Day, so you can follow the live blog on Bloomberg. Now, Apple is the latest victim of the global chip shortage. It's expecting to slash this year's production targets for its latest iPhone model by up to 10 million units, with major chip makers warning that demand will continue to outpace supply throughout next year. There is no quick fix in sight. Well, last night, speakers at the Institute of International Finance weighed in on supply chain problems. Do I see persistence in inflation? Yes. Um, there's, you know, I, do, I believe it's more than transitory related to supply chain issues and commodity prices. Hopefully it will straighten out over the next six months. Uh, history would show it should. If the supply chain holds people back from certain goods, they find other places to spend it. People are very, very confident that, uh, you know, they are transitory, that they will be solved. And whether it's three months, six months, nine months, I don't know. Um, I don't think it'll personally, I don't think it'll be longer than that. So, um, you know, I am confident that we will get past this. Well, joining us now to talk more about supply chains is Elise Badois, Managing Director and Deputy Head of Research in EMEA at City. Elise, as always, thank you so much for coming on Bloomberg. We were hearing there from some of the chief executives talking about supply chains. And this, I know, is also what your research focuses on, is if you have, you know, a, a lot of supply chains being disrupted, leading to inflation, what kind of earnings crop will we get? So obviously, uh, supply chain disruption is the highlight of this earnings season. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, uh, in the first half, uh, very high expectation in earnings, broadly met by the by the company. Actually, not always rewarded by the market, anticipating further supply chain issues and further inflation. Um, I think the, the key at the moment is to look at the, the various sectors that we have and how the supply chain disruption differently impacts them yeah. uh, and I think we can go perhaps into that later on but really the difference is we're going into Q3 and we're going to look for those signs and yeah. investors are really positioning looking for that. So how do you break down these industries? I, I know you can't talk specific stocks but mm -hmm. we had Apple and that of course goes to you know if you have deep pockets and you have a problem with your supply chain then it could probably affect the tech sector as a whole as opposed to luxury stocks that are seem to be getting better like how do you pick the industries you like? So if you're really trying to look for the supply chain disruption and how it's impacting different industries you have some industry that actually some industries that actually don't don't worry about it at all. Financials, for example, obviously financials at the moment. You know, you've got dividends uh, coming back. It, it's a, it's it's the best place to be if you're worried about supply chain. But leaving that aside for a moment, uh, looking at, for example, the luxury space. Obviously, you have pricing power where inflation kicks in, where you have cost and disruption coming in. Then really, uh, your 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 pricing power does matter. Now, obviously, uh, looming in the background is is growth and China and China slow down and that's that's the issue that we face. I mean, if you think inflation is coming and it's and is rampant and we'll talk a little bit of that, about that more um, shortly mm -hmm. is it the right way to play it through financial is it is there actually another sector that can benefit from that? 
obviously uh, the obvious place, uh, the well-known place, the classic place is energy, uh, because energy will always, uh, uh, you know, essentially follow inflation, and, and that's that's your best hedge traditionally. Uh, but I think as investors look forward, certainly what we advise, what our, what our strategy would look at is also valuation. And obviously, uh, with earnings momentum and dividend coming back, yields coming back, and a background where we are going to see rate hikes uh, mm -hmm. later in the year, certainly we forecast that. City expects 10-year um, uh, treasury yields to uh, reach 2%. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all, all going to favor financials. So. In our, from our perspective, financials and energy would be two good places. Do you have? Do you actually, for example, break it down in you know U.S. industries compared to Europe, or mm -hmm. because a lot of these companies are so global, it doesn't really make you know that much of a difference? Yeah. So I think you know it's it's very important to to look at uh, when you think about inflation. Why do we have inflation? Why? why let's go back to that. We essentially uh, you've got to answer a very strong demand. You had stimulus, uh, which we expect to fade, obviously, uh, and all of that has driven essentially very fast uh, uh, purchasing, etc., clogging the systems. Now, when we go back to the various industries uh, and how they're impacted. Uh, initially, we had strong support from demand, mm -hmm. but as demand fades away, obviously we're going to have issue with margins. Mm -hmm. Margins tend to rise at the beginning of the cycle, and then they start to compress, mm -hmm. and that's where we're going to see a bifurcation. So where in the past, for example, we might have recommended consumer discretionary as a great mm hedge, -hmm. because actually part of consumer discretionary have very strong pricing power, mm -hmm. and for example, consumer staples doesn't really have as much pricing power. Actually, at the moment, the issue we face is that earnings are going to decelerate, so the top line is going to decelerate as well. Uh, and and that's, that's an issue for more consumer type of sectors. Hence the recommendation to look more at, uh, I guess, energy or financials. Elise, thank you so much. Elise Bedouin there, uh, head of EMEA Equity Research at City, stays with us and we'll talk more about also portfolio building, maybe the 60-40. Uh, we have a story on that that's playing out very well on the Bloomberg Terminal. Smart conversations continue right here on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we also hear from our interview with the Standard Charter Chief Executive, Bill Winters. He talks about stagflation. We'll also get Elise Bedouin's thoughts on the subject. And then later on in the program, we speak uh, to the former Unilever Chief Executive, Paul Pullman, about his latest book on climate change and inequality. Now, if you have any questions for any of our guests, IB plus TV Go, or you can tweet me directly at Flack One. This is Bloomberg. I think the biggest worry that we hear about is stagflation. Uh, so you clearly see the inflationary pressures. We've heard the, the, the narrative from pretty much any policymaker that you speak to that is transitory. And I think that the inflationary pressures are transitory. But I also see structural wage pressures uh, that are building up on the back of a, of a reasonably strong economy and, 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 and other dislocations that will not be easily resolved. Uh, so th th I think the inflation trend is, uh, to, to say that it's purely transitory, I think would be, uh, would be a little bit dismissive. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, economic growth, as, as, we, as we withdraw the, the stimulus plug, whether it's you know, the early stages of, of pulling back from monetary stimulus uh, and the inevitable uh, contraction in, in terms of fiscal stimulus, both of which need to happen, uh, we'll see the wind come out of the sail of the economy a bit. Thankfully, the momentum is quite good. It, you know, it's, it's in, in China, we're talking about growth dropping down to 5%, maybe a bit below for a while, but then, then coming back up. Okay, well, 5% is, is in the second biggest economy in the world is pretty good. The U.S., as we know, is, is tremendously resilient, and uh, I think we'll also recover. So I'm not, very, I'm not desperately concerned about the economy, but I think it's going to be a little bit harder. And so that means, that. what, a correction for the markets? Look, oh, or big, volatility? Big, big question. I, I think the markets are extremely interest rate sensitive right now. So it, it, to the extent that, that, that the market really prices in short-term rates going up, I do think we'll have a, have a correction at that point. But the underlying earnings still look okay. And, uh, and in, even if we have global growth going a bit below potential, so down into, into the 3% sort of zone for a while, the underlying release of, of, of pressure that comes from, from uh, the pandemic receding it's pretty supportive for the global economy. So I'd say we feel okay about it. Uh, unless the, what the energy prices put a lot of pressure on margins. The, well, energy prices are real. And, and this, is, this is sort of part of that disinflationary, or sorry, this inflationary dislocation, uh, which you know, w w economists and others will debate at some length whether this is transitory or not. It, it, it feels a little bit stickier than, than 
complete, complete dismissal. But yeah, for sure, I think if you got uh, you know, Brent into the you know, well above 100 consistently, there would be an economic impact. But you know, thankfully, the world is also becoming a little bit less dependent on, on fossil fuels, only a little bit less. Well, that was Standard Charger Chief Executive Bill Winters speaking about inflation. We'll speak to him a little bit later, or we'll show you actually when we spoke about climate change and also about fintech a little bit later in the program. We also have another exclusive banking interview coming up. We'll speak to Santander's Anna Boutin. That's a little bit later, 6 p.m. in New York, 11 p.m. UK time. Now let's get back to Elise Badois, head of VMEA Equity Research at City. Elise, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for sticking around. And we were just hearing from Bill Winters of Standard Charger talking about stagflation, some of the dynamics that he sees in the markets. Are you expecting quite a lot of volatility as you know, monetary policy and, I guess, central banks try to adjust to this new reality? The, the key, the key uh, to watch is obviously uh, this idea that uh, I think he uh, particularly highlighted the transitory nature of inflation. Everyone agrees on that. Essentially, if you break, in, if you break it down, my perspective is always bottom up as a head of equity research. If you break it down into wage inflation, perhaps commodity induced inflation, input cost inflation, essentially the rhetoric has been that much of it is transitory. But actually, when we look at, at the data, so essentially we expect, for example, in the UK, inflation to peak at 4.8%. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, when you look at it, it's supposed to accelerate uh, on our economies, you know, from 2.4% to 3.4% into 2022. Now, obviously, it's where we land in the end that matters. So actually, it might be transitory, but where does it land in, you know, when, where, what is the base level that we end up with? Because that, that is going to definitely impact the economy, the purchasing power, yeah. uh, and, and the trend for the growth. So that is the key question with inflation. And I believe that, you know, we've just had UK numbers and they, they fell slightly, uh, uh, you know, they, they came slightly above, well, actually, you know, we, we just had GDP, some GDP numbers in the UK that were actually a bit below consensus. So we now find ourselves in a situation where we have inflation, but we don't really have the growth. Yeah. Uh, and that, 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 that gives a number of questions for next year in terms of how we're going to deal with interest rates. Okay. We also had this crazy survey, and I say crazy because actually uh, many different investors or traders have a different definition of stagflation. Where actually, yep. you know, there's an economic definition, but what you think is a problem for central banks could be different from one trader to, to the next. Correct. I mean, how much volatility does that mean for equities to come? How, you know, could, could we ski like a, a schism as people interpret some of these numbers differently? Yeah, I mean, let's take a step back and think about sentiment with equities. Obviously, the, the road is going to be bumpy from now right. on because uh, earnings, you know, we expect EPS to go down from about 44 uh, uh, percent. You know, the earnings went up by 44 percent this year, EPS, and then they're going down to about 9 percent globally. Right. Uh, the picture is sort of similar. Europe sits somewhere somewhere there, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's quite acute for the UK. Earnings are going up 70% uh, 2021 on our estimates. They're going to go down to about 2% next year because you've got a lot of uh, you've got a mining component mm -hmm. in the UK. You've got some really. So actually, as we go into Q3 and we're going to have news, we're going to have news about China slowdown, etc. That's going to, I think, even more than inflation. That's going to lead to a little bit of. Uh, of stress in the system. There's going to be that idiosyncratic news that makes the market mm -hmm. worry. Why? Because also valuations are testing. Right. And let's not let's not kill ourselves. Yeah. You know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, you've got testing valuation. Perhaps not in the UK. It's 12 times, but you've got yeah. the US on 21 yeah. times. And I, I worry that uh, essentially we've got we're going to have testing valuations, which which lead to volatility on every so, bad news. Elisa, what looks expensive right now? I mean, tech seems yep. like the obvious way, but do, can you find value in certain parts of tech? So uh, in certain parts of tech, you, you probably can. I mean, you know, we've actually reined back tech to, um, uh, to neutral, particularly because of the sensitivity to interest rates. Yeah. But you will find in places some opportunities, particularly in Europe. But this is not big tech, exactly. big US tech. Yeah. And on that, we're neutral and, and we're reined back to neutral. And that's really due to the interest rate sensitivity. Uh, I think, you know, when you want to look for value, obviously, we do expect that value rotation mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK is the best market for that, trading on 12 times, some good value plays there. Uh, and and then, you know, other, 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 other sectors that we would recommend, financial, healthcare and industrials. Industrials no. still have some way to go. Um, what's your take on UK stocks at the moment? So given the multiples that you were saying, do you, I mean, are you, are you bullish that actually yeah they we're look very attractive? I mean yeah we, we expect some news on the UK I think perhaps to give a little bit of a, a, a of a trick 
in what we expect in terms of value realization sometimes comes in the form of M&A. Yeah. So sometimes it's not all stocks all at the yeah. same time, 2% a day. Sometimes it's going to be that sort of mid-cap M&A that we actually expect. Elise, thank you so much for coming on today. Elise Badwa there, head of EMEA Equity Research at City, joining us this morning. Now coming up, Russia is seeing Europe's gas crisis as a golden opportunity. Will Putin push the EU to change rules on pricing and Nord Stream 2? We're live in Moscow next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Russia is seeing Europe's energy crisis as a golden opportunity. Now, fresh from his intervention into markets last week, Vladimir Putin now wants to press the EU to rewrite some of its rules around the gas market. Now, he may use a speech at the Russian Energy Week today to push the EU away from spot pricing towards long-term gas contracts and even more importantly, a quick certification of Nord Stream 2. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is our senior reporter for international affairs, joining us from Moscow, Henry Meyer. Henry, great to speak to you today. So there's a lot of things that Putin wants Hello. from the EU. Out of everything he wants, what will he get? Well, I mean, certainly uh, the top of the of the list of, um, of things that uh, Russia is pushing for at the moment is uh, to um, renegotiate the contracts uh, for supply of gas to Europe. And in recent years, uh, Europe, uh, the European Union has insisted that uh, a lot of these contracts uh, shift to a, uh, a price mechanism based on spot prices, whereas Russia prefers uh, the, uh, the previous system um, linked to oil prices, um, long-term contracts. Uh, so this is going to be one of the main demands that Russia makes. Uh, uh, senior Russian officials have been repeating this uh, over the last few days, and they really do see this as um, the, an, an incredible opportunity that has arisen thanks to the uh, crisis in Europe to press these demands. So uh, Henry, will Nord Stream 2 actually become, you know, become a bargaining chip in this ongoing crisis? Uh, Nord Stream 2, yes, I mean, it's, it's been such a problematic uh, project that was held up for, for, for a long time uh, by American sanctions. It is now finally constructed, uh, but it's uh, entering, you know, a very uh, complicated period now, regulatory approval uh, in the EU. And again, you know, Russia sees this as a, um, a fantastic time to push that through. Uh, uh, with the argument that if, well, if you don't allow us to use this pipeline uh, to start pumping gas through it, we can't come to, uh, to your rescue to help you, as you are asking right now. Henry, thank you so much for the update. Of course, we'll have plenty more from Henry throughout the day. Uh, Henry Mayer there from our bureau chief in Moscow. Now, we'll have a lot going on, of course, when it looks at the markets and when we look at inflation expectations. This is a picture overall. Now, we look at exactly what we can hear from CPI later in the U.S., and then the focus, of course, will be on the banks with J.P. Morgan uh, coming up shortly. Now, let's get straight, I think, to the Bloomberg. First word news. If she's here, she's Leanne Gerentz. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Francine, and sorry for being late. The world is failing to invest enough to escape climate change and avoid sharp increases in fossil fuel prices. That's a warning from the International Energy Agency. The IEA says that investment in green energy like solar and wind is lagging what's needed to meet climate targets. At the same time, it says fossil fuel spending is also insufficient to meet current growth in demand. Now, the House has approved a short-term increase in the U.S. government's debt limit, sending the legislation to President Biden just days before the Treasury was set to run out of borrowing authority. The vote only delays another partisan confrontation on debt and spending in less than two months' time. The UK says the Northern Ireland protocol is harming the region and has to change. Speaking in Lisbon, Brexit Minister David Frost called for the current agreement to be replaced. Frost did leave room for compromise, saying the UK is prepared for a negotiation with the EU without triggering a larger trade war. The EU's chief Brexit negotiator will lay out a counter-proposal today. U.S. federal judges have upheld New York COVID vaccine requirements in three separate decisions as a contentious issue winds its way through the court system. The ruling rejected claims against mandatory jabs lodged on racial, medical and religious grounds. Meanwhile, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has outlawed vaccine mandates in the second largest U.S. 
US state, setting the stage for a showdown with the federal government. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Apologies again, Francie. <laughs> Always, Leanne. We love you, no matter when you arrive. Now, coming up, we speak to the former Unilever chief executive, Paul Pullman, about a new book he's co-authored called Net Positive. It's all about climate change. It also tackles inequality and what we can do ahead of COP26. Uh, later on in the program, we bring you more from our exclusive interview with Bill Winters. He also has a thing or two to say about uh, fossil fuels and, of course, financing those. If you have any questions for any of our guests, just IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. risks in the frame. U.S. CPI is due today. Atlanta Fed president brings out swear jar and says transitory is a dirty word. Chip crunch bites Apple. The company is likely to slash its iPhone production target on the processor shortage. And Bill Winters exclusive, the standard charter chief executive, does not pull any punches and tells Bloomberg China is not dumb enough for a leading moment. More on our conversation throughout the sound. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, first thing is first, we always check the markets to try and uh, keep abreast of exactly what's going on. A lot of the focus, of course, is on earnings. We had LVMH giving a little bit of a lift to luxury uh, stocks. Uh, of course, a little bit, um, or growth slowed, but they're still growing quite significantly. And then the focus is on chip shortages because of that announcement from Apple. So the chief executive of Standard Chartered says it's unreasonable to expect banks to stop financing the fossil fuel industry. In an exclusive interview, Bill Winters told us that's in part because doing so would undermine transition efforts, particularly in the emerging markets. Well, I spoke to him exclusively ahead of COP26. One of the criteria for our, car, core, for our core carbon principles is that we do no harm. So if, you, if you're doing harm to local communities, indigenous people, to biodiversity, right. it's not going to qualify as a, as a contract under our core carbon principle. That's the sort of the defensive approach. The offensive approach is to say what we want to do is, is, is create a market, and we are doing that right now, uh, which says, yeah, this is the carbon standard that we've set. But there's also, you may have additional attributes that are valuable to you. So local employment, uh, protection of water resources, N not do no harm, but actually do some good. You may want to pay extra for that contract. So when we talk to, to the, the people who are really big in the in climate investment game, Many of them happen to be oil companies or, or other large airlines. I mean, they're very advanced in their thinking on this. Uh, they're investing directly in projects to protect rainforest, but almost always with a secondary objective as well. Promote local employment, uh, to, to, to protect biodiversity, protect uh, natural carbon sinks that also protect carbon diversity, uh, biodiversity. Uh, and they'll pay more for that because it's important to them and their business model. Uh, we want to make sure that, that, that we also capture that into the transparent market mm -hmm. to help just get that, that virtuous circle where there's a... Uh, th th there's a sense that you're doing something good, uh, but you're, it's also by, by being transparent, you're getting the scale and the acceptability. Okay. I mean, we can do more. Are we transparent enough? D right now, no. Right now, it's, uh, right now, the, the vast majority of what happens in, in, in the, in the effectively in the, the climate finance. offset space yep. is, is over the counter and right. undisclosed. So we're trying to urge everybody to, to come forth, uh, you know, put put the trades out onto a platform. So I think one of the things Senator Trotter has done is, to, to, together with with uh, partners in Singapore, we've created something called Climate Impact. X. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, we've got our, our first auction of, of uh, high integrity carbon projects that's coming out right now. 12 projects, all nature based, uh, in, uh, uh, for the most part in Southeast Asia, maybe all in Southeast Asia. And uh, we wanted to create some noise around this and say we want to be transparent. You know, so it's an auction. You, you, we're going we're to publish the price. And hopefully that will bring more people into the market. Bill, final question. When do you think will be the day where actually banks say, I am not financing fossil fuel anymore? It depends on what you mean by not financing fossil fuel. So uh, I, I think the, the, the day that banks are completely disengaged from the fossil yeah. fuel industry will be the, the day that there's no more fossil fuels. Uh, but if, if you look at the International Energy Agency or, or Science-Based Target Initiative or, or you know, people who have really studied this carefully, in 2050, we're still going to be producing 
oil and gas. Coal is more debatable, but we're definitely going to be producing oil and gas. But, but no new wells. Nothing new. Well, maybe, maybe new wells, but what we'll also oh. have by then, and this is embedded in the science, is technology which is scalable and economic to take the carbon out of the environment, whether it's carbon capture or storage or, 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 or development of green hydrogen technologies, uh, things of that nature. But that's, uh, yeah, that's, so out of the fossil fuel industry, I don't know, uh, when, when can we stand up and say uh, we are highly confident that we are on a, a science-based target to zero emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement, which should do our part to save the planet, like in the next couple of weeks? That was my exclusive interview with Standard Charger Chief Executive Bill Winters. Now let's stay on the climate conversation. Former Unilever Chief Executive Paul Pullman has co-authored a new book called Net Positive. It tackles climate change and inequality. Now he claims that the Thrive, that to thrive companies must become net positive, giving more to the world than they take. Well, Paul Pullman, welcome to Bloomberg. A lot of the conversation, this is something that you've been spearheading or actually advocating for in the last decade at least. Are companies getting the message now? or do they just see the business opportunity? Well, that's actually both. The uh, business opportunities are enormous. We're uh, discovering with COVID that we had to spend significantly more on treating the uh, issue, which is a direct result of biodiversity, destruction, climate change. The money we've spent, $16 trillion, $25 trillion lost in the global economy. I think many people have realized not only can you not have healthy people on an unhealthy planet, but the cost of our failings are enormous. So more and more businesses see this as an enormous opportunity. We now have 20% of the business community making commitments that are uh, getting you to net zero by 2050, uh, signing up to the science-based targets. And uh, the movement that we have seen over the last 12, uh, 24 months has been enormous. What does that mean, uh, Paul, of what we can expect at COP26? A lot of investors, unfortunately, already think that it, we're not going to get enough agreements to make a real difference. We have, what, two weeks left until Glasgow starts happening. Is there anything that we can do in the meantime? Yeah, well, uh, partly it's management of expectation. If anybody expects the magic wand to come out at Glasgow and all of a sudden all of the sign up to a, 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 with real plans to, to decarbonize our global economy, it's not going to happen. So this will be a conference where we need to put the ambitions up, where we need to see significant progress and continue to work after that. The key thing is that we get more countries to commit to being net zero. We have uh, moved up from about uh, 40 countries a year ago to about 130 countries now to make that commitment. There are some countries trailing. More importantly, we want these countries to make commitments by 2030. Uh, currently, our carbon emissions are projected to increase by 15% over this decade, whilst we need a 45% reduction. So that's by all means possible. And then we need to do some things because we're in this together. So we need to be sure that we have the 100 billion climate fund to help the emerging markets build adaptation and resilience. We have to be sure that we make some commitments to go out of coal, for example. We absolutely can't wait for that. And, uh, and build this global trust, if you want to, that we're in this together. Um, Paul, I mean, we hear a lot about greenwashing and we hear a lot about, you know, credits that actually don't do much good because it's just disguising some of the bad things that are happening in terms of climate change. Like, what's the right approach? If you're a chief executive and you're committed but want to do more, what should you be looking at? Well, what we talk about in our net positive, uh, how courageous companies thrive by giving more than they take, is that first and foremost, the companies need to take ownerships of their total handprint in society. You need to, uh, for example, when it comes to climate change, you need to take responsibility of your total value chain, not only scope one and two, like most of them do, um, but the overall impact. If you're in the food business and deforestation or land degradation are part of the climate uh, emitting things, you have to take responsibility and start to think net positive. Uh, many companies are now making commitments, for example, to move to regenerative agriculture, capturing the carbon again in the soil versus degrading the soil, making commitments to not have deforestation in the value chains. This responsibility yeah. starts, and that is the most important thing. The second thing that companies can do is to uh, join these coalitions to make these targets and these commitments public. And that hopefully gives the uh, courage to many of the governments in this world to start to move faster. 
there's a clear gap right now at the governmental level between the say and the do that needs to be closed. And we certainly have that opportunity between now and Glasgow to give them a little bit more yeah. courage, may I say. Paul, is there a danger that actually, you know, finance that could be a force for good is a force for advancement, but also greenwashing? And what would be the one thing that you would tell asset managers and finance who want to do good right now? Well, I think more and more people in the financial sector have caught on that um, that moving to more ESG or climate mitigation is the way to go. We now have um, over $90 trillion of money on the management making financial commitments for Glasgow under an initiative that Mike Carney is leading to uh, decarbonize their portfolios um, <coughs> and, and stay <laughs> below the one and a half degrees. Um, we have the TCFD coming in. It was uh, with 100 companies. It's now 2,300 companies. Um, we have more and more countries putting it in legislation. A year ago, it was nine. Now it's 45. So the financial yeah. market is moving. Uh, ESG investment is increasing. It's estimated to be about $50 trillion by 2025. So I would say you'd be stupid in the financial market if you don't want to be uh, uh, aggressively a part of that. Yet, we still see behavior that is not consistent, where there is short-term money to be made, still enormous lending by some of the biggest banks mm -hmm. to call, still financing transitions that you know move in the wrong direction. So we need to get this collectively up to the levels if we want to reach the ambitions. We, uh, it's a, it's a, well, a, a bigger gap that we have to overcome than perhaps some people realize. Uh, Paul, give me a sense of exactly some of the things that actually, you, you know, you worry about. So this is definition, a common definition, um, this transition phase. If you look at the energy crisis, is it worrying that we've had to go back to, you know, coal plants, for example, in China? And will that just give an excuse to governments to delay this transition? Well, the current crisis that you see on the energy market is a crisis partly driven by transition pains and partly driven by uh, bad planning at the global level with the uh, global economy is coming out shorter term out of this pandemic uh, low base, and we weren't very well prepared for this. Uh, the China demand, obviously, the lack of reserves in Europe, but more importantly, the underinvestments in green energy. What the energy, International Energy Agency and others point out study after study is that by all means we can get to the commitments that we've made of a 45 percent reduction in the next 10 years provided we step up. We need to at least step up by a factor of three the money that we spent on green energy. And unfortunately, what we have seen a little bit uh, with the government spending coming out of this uh, terrible crisis is that it is easier to go short term back to the old economy and keep some of yeah. these uh, systems in place than moving to the new economy. So it takes a little bit of an act of faith and with the politicians being under pressure and often focused on the next election cycle, we have to be sure that there is enough voices from civil society, from the NGO community, from the business community, that this is the moment to move forward. There is actually no alternative here. Uh, Paul, thank you so much, as always, for your time. Paul Pullman, there, former Unilever chief executive and co-author of the new book, Net Positive. Now, fintech may be a game of life or death for big banking institutions. Up next, we'll speak more uh, to or more of our exclusive conversation with the Standard Charger chief executive, Bill Winters, and his take on innovation in the digital banking space. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, one day, there will be two kinds of banks, those that are still relevant and those that don't have a strong digital banking presence. That's according to the Standard Chartered Chief Executive Bill Winters. Now, he says that his bank is doing a great job of innovating internally, but shareholders won't take into account the value of fintech within big institutions until it starts to show profit. Well, I caught up with Bill Winters yesterday. I think what we're seeing right now is that the, the, the biggest fintechs are actually happening within banks. Now, they, they get lost in the context of, of the bigger bank, uh, but, but when you look at the, the amount of deal activity or transaction activity that's going through some of the, the, the very high market value fintechs right now, uh, it's actually quite small relative to the identical 
identically digitally driven right. volumes that are going to happen in banks. Uh, but because they're not very profitable, and we see that from the, the profitability of think tanks, I mean, most of them aren't profitable at all, uh, and certainly inside banks, they're no more profitable at this stage, maybe a little bit more profitable if, if we can get to some scale quickly. But, uh, but they're not turning the dial in terms of, of your bottom line operating earnings, and therefore it's not finding its way in, into value. But the relevance to customers is very clear. And uh, it, it starts with the, the things we all know about, which is small value payments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the fintech industry disrupted small value payments. Banks have quickly caught up, uh, including cross-currency small value payments, so, so remittances and, and, and cross-border payments. And that's, uh, I think banks are, are, are delivering that quite well. The fintechs are super creative, right? and they're, they're well-funded, extremely creative, and very fast. And don't have the legacy infrastructure that the banks have, and, and probably don't have quite the same regulatory oversight, although our regulators would never acknowledge that. But, but is it, you know, buy now, pay later? The, I think, the I think it, it, as we move from the, call it the, the, the liability side of the bank balance sheet, which is deposits and then, and then payments and, and foreign exchange off the back of that, it's definitely moving now into credit. And it's interesting that you know, some of the earliest fintechs were actually peer-to-peer -peer lenders, right? And, uh, and the peer-to-peer -peer lenders had carved out I mean, what everyone thought was going to be a fundamentally different way of intermediating credit. They have a role to play, but it hasn't been a huge game changer in, in the world. Uh, and, uh, but but the, 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 the fintech applications, I think, could be, mostly because of the access to data uh, that the big technology companies have from the convenience platform. So if you look at the phenomenal success of, of Alibaba and Financial uh, and Tencent, now obviously that subsequently has incurred some, some regulatory problems, but uh, their ability to understand their customer better and to make better credit decisions, I'll say for the benefit of us and others who, who then took those loans off their, you know, off their origination channel, it's, it's very, very strong. We're doing the same thing with, with a project that we call Nexus in Indonesia, where we partnered with Bukalapak biggest e-commerce platform in Indonesia, 100 million customers and growing super fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were delivering a full range of banking products, including, as we roll them out, uh, buy now, pay later, uh, and, and other credit products, credit cards, and then eventually wealth products and other things. Well, that was our exclusive conversation with Standard Charter Chief Executive Bill Winters. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Sources tell us Apple is set to slash production of its iPhone 13 by 10 million units due to the chip supply crunch. We're told the company had expected to produce 90 million handsets in the last three months of the year, but component shortages from Broadcom and Texas Instruments have forced a cut. The average lead time for chips rose for a ninth straight month in September to more than 21 weeks. Now China's exports surged to a new monthly record in September. Strong demand in advance of the holiday shopping season outweighed the effects of power shortages across the country. Exports grew 28.1 percent in dollar terms from a year earlier, beating economists' expectations for a 21.5 percent gain. SAP has raised its full year revenue forecast on accelerating cloud sales in a promise sign for turnaround plans at Europe's biggest software company. SAP says 2021's cloud revenue will grow 16 to 19 percent in constant currency from a year earlier. Tesla's China-made cars notched up another rise in domestic shipments to more than 52,000 units for September, even as general auto sales declined. Total China shipments for the month were up 27% on exports are included. That follows a near 50% jump in August at last week's annual shareholder meeting. CEO Elon Musk said Tesla's Shanghai factory is now outproducing the Fermont, California plant. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, the luxury boom continues as Beijing's crackdown on China's mega-rich fails to impact sales. We have more market reaction on LVMH's third quarter sales boost. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's take a look at what we're watching out for today at 12 p.m. UK time. JP Morgan releases its third quarter earnings. Then closely followed at 1.30 p.m. 
is U.S. CPI. 1.30 p.m., Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin launches its new Shepard NS-18 into space. And then at 3 p.m., G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meet in Washington. 7 p.m., watch out for the latest FOMC minutes. They're released. And then later on, the IMF managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, speaks during the IMF and World Bank annual meetings. Now, on to some of the earnings that we had over the last 24 hours. LVMH growth slowed from the previous quarter when sales surged post-lockdown. Still, organic revenue at the fashion and leather goods unit rose 24% from a year earlier, beating analyst expectations. Now, LVMH says it's confident that the current growth will continue. Well, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Deirdre Hipwell. Deirdre, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's an exciting space, and I guess um, investors are a little bit or, or less worried than they were maybe 24 hours ago because LVMH, the first to report a trading up and you know in terms of trend it's growing not as much as it used to but it's still growing absolutely I think investors will be very reassured by these figures um, overall the results were in line and in fact leather and fashion goods which is the really key unit at LVMH actually performed better than expected and you know on a two-year basis fashion and leather sales were up 38 percent which is pretty extraordinary when you consider we've had a global pandemic in the midst of that Yes, the growth has slowed from the second quarter, but in a way that's not surprising because if you think about what was happening in the second quarter, we were all heading back to the shops after lockdown ended, so there was a real bounce back in spending. So I think overall, as you say, LVMH goes first, and I think investors will feel very reassured that it shows that there is still growth in the sector, maybe just not at the same pace as before. So, Juju, investors worried about China ahead of these results. So did LVMH also reassure about China? Well, yes, I think they did. Um, obviously, the, the push for common prosperity in, in China and, and, you know, and the efforts to reduce the, the wealth gap had been weighing on luxury stocks, particularly in August. But on uh, the call yesterday, LVMH's CFO said that they weren't particularly worried about it and they didn't think it would have a major impact on the kind of core upper middle class customers that make up its client base. So I think investors will take a lot of heart from those comments. So, Deirdre, are, are Chinese visitors actually returning to Europe? Doesn't seem so at the moment. I think there has been some return, but LVMH was saying that they're not seeing the same um, trend in Chinese tourist sales in Europe yet. Partly this might still be to do with a lot of the travel restrictions that we're seeing. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, luxury retailers will be hoping that returns because that has often been a big driver of, of growth. But at the moment, they're not back at pre-pandemic levels. Deirdre, thanks so much. Deirdre Hipwell there from Bloomberg. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin. Kaylee Lines will be in New York. We look at full earnings. Of course, we have JP Morgan coming up, so we'll have a full roundup of the bank earnings. But in general, European stocks, U.S. equity futures also bouncing uh, before inflation data out of the U.S. Again, if you look at some of the earnings report, a lot of the focus will be to try to figure out what these rising costs mean for corporate health. And then, of course, one of our main stories is Apple because of the chip shortage. This is Bloomberg. clearly see the inflationary pressures. We've heard the, the, the narrative from pretty much any policymaker that you speak to that is transitory. Data from multiple sources point to these lasting longer than most initially thought. And by this definition then, the forces are not transitory. My baseline case um, is, is not for stagflation over a you know, medium run horizon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, October 13th. Our top stories today. Apple gets crunched. The global chip shortage is forcing the company to cut production of the new iPhone model by as many as 10 million units. Will JP Morgan set the tone for Wall Street? Will the bank kicks off third quarter earnings for big lenders today? And Inflation Nation, the U.S. Consumer Price Index, comes out a little more than three hours from now. Investors will, of course, look for signs that rising prices are more than just transitory. 
So, Kelly, this will all play out in the markets. It's basically on one hand, we're looking at earnings on earnings watch and inflation watch, especially in the U.S. Yeah, there's a lot going on today, Francine, so buckle up and get ready. As for what the Asian session looked like overnight, broadly, it was positive across stocks, bonds, and currencies, by and large, at least. There were a few exceptions to that, including Japanese equities, which actually did fall on the day. But stocks were up in China, and actually, markets were closed for stock trading in Hong Kong due to a typhoon. Now, a few individual equities to watch in the Asian session. Of course, Apple suppliers broadly were under pressure after that Bloomberg report last night that Apple is going to slash its production for target for the iPhone 13 for the year due to that semiconductor shortage. So that weighed on equities like Japan Display, which was down the better part of 3% overnight. In China, though, you did see a big lift for some education stocks, some much needed relief for a sector that has come under regulatory pressure. And that was after China released new guidelines promoting vocational education. So that lifted shares, including Kaiyuan Education Technology up 20% in the overnight session. Two commodity stories to pay attention to, though. Of course, in China, you still have an ongoing power shortage as well as flooding in coal mines. That has made coal a very hot commodity and futures rose to another record high today. But iron ore down about 10% in two days, down 4.5% today. A lot of concern about demand from steel producers. Now, as for the picture here in the U.S., we have about two hours until J.P. Morgan earnings and then three and a half hours until CPI. So the market really just waiting and watching for that. Ahead of those key catalysts, though, S&P 500 futures are higher by about two tenths of one percent after being lower earlier on in the session. And in the bond market, we are seeing yields coming in just a basis point on the 10 year Treasury, even further south of 160 right now at 156.47. The dollar is weaker on the day. And then I would point to crude after eight Gains in nine days, Matt. We are looking a little softer this morning. WTI down around half of 1%, but still above $80 a barrel. Yeah, you know, that softness, Kaylee, in oil and in other commodities also leading to losses on the FTSE. It's very heavily weighted with um, oil producers. So you see BP, for example, a big heavyweight on the FTSE down, as well as commodities producers, Rio Tinto and uh, BHP Billiton also weighing on the FTSE. You can see the red there uh, uh, over the UK in the map. Elsewhere in Europe, we see gains, at least on the, uh, the main benchmarks on the core, the CAC and the DAX are rising. But it kind of evens out in terms of the stock 600, the broader benchmark. There isn't really a lot of movement there. I think the European market also really waiting for these bank earnings, waiting for them to kick off with JP Morgan. And then, of course, over the next three days, we have all of the major Wall Street banks reporting and Europe really wants to see that cue. Uh, Europe also wants to see what's going on with inflation, and we'll get um, the CPI data out to show that. And it, it's really a, a tale of the U.S. leading the rest of the world in terms of not only bank earnings but Fed policy, Francine. We need to see those data points. Yeah, we absolutely need to see those data points, especially after we heard from Richard Clarida yesterday. And of course, as you're mentioning earnings, it's the, the big U.S. banks, but also we have LVMH giving a lift to, to some of the luxury sector in Europe. Now, I'll look at what else is ahead today. As we were saying, J.P. Morgan actually kicks things off bank earnings wise at 7 a.m. New York time. Traders await U.S. CPI data, which comes out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. A lot going on today. Then the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors will meet in Washington. And finally, Jeff Bezos. Bezos's Blue Origin is scheduled to launch its second human space flight mission with actor William Shatner on board. So Apple wow. likely to cut its projected iPhone 13 production targets due to ship shortages. Now the company expects to make 10 million fewer iPhones than planned. I know Matt Miller wants to talk about space. We'll do that in a second, uh, Matt, but let's get straight to Tom McKenzie, who's looking, of course, at Apple. Tom, good morning, first of all. Mm -hmm. My question is, if Apple, that has very deep pockets, can't get the chips, I mean, is there a chance for the rest of us? Well, not just deep pockets, but also arguably the most sophisticated supply chain out there. And they'd lined up, they'd had a plan to deliver about 90 million units. This is the iPhone 13 uh, within this last three month period. They're not going to do that. They're going to cut it, as you say, by 10 million units. Part of this is because the supply constraints from two key suppliers, so Broadcom, which supplies some of their wireless components, they are struggling to get the chips that they need for their businesses and their components to ship to Apple, uh, but also Texas Instruments as well, which relies, it develops its own chips, Texas Instruments, but it also relies on the likes of TSMC over in Taiwan, and they are struggling uh, to get those components. So Broadcom, Texas Instruments supplying to Apple, that is where the constraints is now. Uh, the problem is that there's no short-term fix for this, even for a company uh, like Apple that, of course, is fighting with the car makers as well for these components, the semiconductors. 
and the industry says, the foundries, the likes of TSMC say, this is likely to last until next year, possibly even further beyond that. And we're talking about lead times as well that continue uh, to expand around 22 weeks now in terms of putting your order in and actually getting it delivered. You know, I, you're the perfect person really to lead our tech coverage out of London, Tom, because you've just come from Asia where all these components are produced into the West mm. where um, they're all integrated and then sold. Um, what are we hearing in terms of component shortages and how much that weighs on Apple earnings? Well, certainly the last three months of the year, they're expecting to generate revenue of about 120 billion uh, US dollars. We'll see to what extent this plays into that. But we know already that the iPhone 13 Pro and the Pro Max, which went on sale in September, if you're buying them from the website and you placed an order in September when they went on sale, you're probably not going to get those phones delivered uh, until for about a month uh, after that. The carriers yeah. as well that partner with Apple also reporting that they're getting delays. The silver lining is that so far, according to the Bloomberg reporting, it looks like Apple should be able to make these deliveries for that all-important uh, holiday season. But certainly, uh, this has underscored uh, that broader issue around supply chain constraints and the semiconductor issue uh, specifically. And we're seeing Apple shares lower by about seven tenths of 1% in pre-market trading. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. And earnings season is getting underway unofficially today. JP Morgan reports its third quarter results before the market opens, with analysts looking for the lender to set the tone for big bank stocks. And lucky for us, we have our big banks guru, Shanali Basik, Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter here with us. So, Shanali, what are the key numbers you're going to be looking for out of JP Morgan this well, morning? Well, very simply revenue, Kaylee, because it is expected to be down sequentially. Remember, we're not expecting trading to be as booming as it was in prior quarters. But with that said, JP Morgan a month ago has guided that it could be better than expected. So what exactly does that mean at the end of the day and does it equate to market share gains on top of that? They have also said Jamie Dimon just this week has says they're seeing some loan growth in some areas. And again, how how many areas is is what we're asking at the end of the day and can it be sustained especially as we look forward and uh, expect that at some point we're going to see mortgage rates really rising are people going to be borrowing as much in certain areas when uh, the outlook is not as good for for those products so we'll see how it shapes up at the end yeah. of the day mixed bag yeah it seems like the, the really key question for banks is do we see rates rise because it's so important to them not only in terms of net interest margins but also in terms of all the products that they buy and sell yeah, I'll be looking for the, the outlook that they give. They have guided a little over $52 billion for the full year in net interest income. And should they revise that downward, that would be a very uh, big warning sign to the entire industry. Now, Matt, with that said, the revenue declines that we may see at J.P. Morgan and Bank of America are not expected to be as steep as the ones that we see at the bigger investment banks, given that trading um, moderation. So at the end of the day, we'll be looking for color and commentary on what that means and what they're going to be able to invest at the end of the year when it comes to pay, technology, and bonuses. All right, Bloomberg Shanali Basik, going to be a busy lady for the next couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll have more on bank earnings later this hour with analyst Allison Williams of Bloomberg Intelligence. But first, let's talk about a change coming at the Federal Reserve. Vice Chairman for Supervision Randall Quarles will be removed from his role as Wall Street Bank's main watchdog after his title officially expires today. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins us now from our D.C. Bureau. So, Anne-Marie, President Biden has yet to put forward a nominee for the new Vice Chairman chairman of supervision. What would his Democratic Party like to see? Well, it also comes at a time when we're also waiting for that reappointment potentially of Chair Jay Powell. What his party wants to see is definitely a lean towards progressives and more hawks when it comes to banking regulation. We knew that this uh, position was going to be over for Randall Quarles. What is so interesting is that what the Fed has said it will happen continuously now. There will not be someone in the interim that will take on this role. The fair, the, this board will meet on an unchaired basis, and then if there's consensus, then it will be brought to the full board. So that was something that we learned that is new. But, Kaylee, to your point, this really has to do with the bigger picture. And one potential path forward for the president, what his advisors are talking about, and Bloomberg previously reported, is that to really be able to check boxes of everyone that is involved is to potentially put someone like Governor Brainard in this post, really a little bit more hawkish on the banks, tougher on regulation, but keep Powell at the top job. But again, we still do not have uh, any indication yet from the White House of what exactly they're going to be doing. 
And Marisa, at the same time, the House cleared this short-term debt cap increase, kicking it to December 3rd. We, what's the next negotiation? It's, Francine, as you say, it's just basically kicking the can down the road. This is a Band-Aid. And what's so interesting about the timeline of this uh, increasing the cap by $480 billion is that it now coincides with also the extension and that timeline for the stopgap funding measure. So this means on December 3rd, Congress needs to take action again, not just regarding the debt ceiling, but regarding uh, keeping the government open and those appropriations being paid by the U.S. federal government. So it sets down just another showdown for December 3rd. What we have learned, though, is that the Republicans who allowed a little bit more of an easy path forward to for this uh, minor Band-Aid for the debt ceiling, Senator Mitch McConnell says they will not do so again. So the Democrats are back to square one. Are they going to go via reconciliation or Speaker Pelosi says that she wants it to be done on a bipartisan basis, or potentially uh, she even floated the idea of looking into the Treasury itself, just moving the caps, and then the Congress just voting if they, if they don't agree with the movement from the Treasury. That potentially could get rid of this debt ceiling drama that has really just plagued both parties for years. And we get fresh drama anew in December. Bloomberg's Ann Marie Gordon in Washington, thank you so much. And now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre market trading in the U.S. One of the bigger movers to the upside is Plug Power, which of course makes EV fuel cells. It is higher by the better part of 4% after getting upgraded to overweight at Morgan Stanley. The analyst putting a $40 price target on the stock is trading around $31 a share this morning. To the downside, though, is CRISPR Therapeutics, and this is after it released results from an early stage trial for its blood cancer therapy. Those results disappointing investors, and as a result, the share is down 5.5% in pre-market trading. And, of course, we were just going through the Apple story with Tom McKenzie potentially cutting its iPhone production targets for the year. That's not just weighing on Apple this morning. It is also weighing on its suppliers, including Skyworks Solutions, which gets about half of its revenue from Apple. It's down about 2.5% before the bell frenzy. Kelly, we'll have plenty more, of course, on some of those stocks. Plus, also coming up this hour, not so transitory, the Atlantic Fed president, Raphael Bostic, says inflation is broadening and lasting longer than expected. Then Jane Fraser has a plan to remake Citigroup. We've got the big take on Fraser's new strategy, plus an exclusive conversation with the Standard Church Chief Executive Bill Winters. He gives his take on innovation in the digital banking space. That's all coming up a little bit later. This is Bloomberg. It is becoming increasingly clear that the feature of this episode that has animated price pressures, mainly the intense and widespread supply chain disruptions, will not be brief. Data from multiple sources point to these lasting longer than most initially thought. And by this definition, then, the forces are not transitory. Very interesting stuff there from Atlanta Fed Chief Raphael Bostic saying inflation is broadening and lasting longer than expected. We've got a chart from the New York Fed. And for those of you joining us in London DAB Digital, I'll just walk you through what we've seen. Expectations from uh, consumers are rising at a record. This, uh, this survey, I believe, from the New York Fed is about eight years old, and we're at the highest level that we've ever been. In terms of one-year inflation expectations, 5.3%. Um, so it's a lot more than the target, more than double the target, almost triple it. Mark Cudmore, Bloomberg macro strategist, joins us now. Mark, how concerned should we be or is the market getting more and more concerned about inflation? Absolutely. We've been talking about inflation all year, but I think more people are starting to realize that as Bostic says, transitory really is, is the wrong word to use. It is a dirty word. I love the way you had a swear jar there. I'm just a little bit upset that you cut the clip off before we saw him put money in it. But I think ultimately, the Fed has backed themselves into a corner. But they keep on talking about transitory. And, and that's a, a very, very loose term. And that's what we're struggling to define. What is transitory now? People are talking about whether it'll feed into medium-term expectations, which could be 18, 24-month horizon. The Fed has been boxed in by transitory. It's dangerous. They need to back away from it very, very quickly without panicking the market. But clearly, the market now realizes that even if you think transitory is still means it's not permanent or not persistent, it can last a lot longer than we thought a few months ago. 
Mark, how much of a repricing could we see in asset classes because of that CPI print? Like, what exactly is priced in right now? So, uh, I think that today, well, I mean, look, 5.3% of the expectations year on year, I'm not going to kind of say it's pricing it much different. I actually think today's print is important only because of what's happening this week or two. But remember, this is not yeah. the print that's capturing these oil right. price moves. So, in many ways, today won't be the real Pretty, big inflation yeah. print. It's actually, we're worried about what the inflation print is going to be next month, which is why we're focused on this one. It's all about the breakdown today. So, it's not the headline number we're going to care about today. It's all about whether there's other factors that are suddenly moving to these supply chain problems. But, Mark, to that point, what we're going to be focused on is the core CPI print, which backs out food and energy, where a lot of these inflation fears have stemmed from. Do we need to start thinking about it differently and care less about the core? I, I know. I think ultimately core is very, very important. But the only reason I say look beyond the core, still care about the headline, is that Look, I think this is becoming a big enough problem. It's not, you don't want to take the economist take. The economist take is this is transitory, and that's why central banks are going to go, this is transitory. The problem is we are seeing big enough headline prints month after month that are just in those papers that people open up every day that they say, I'm reading about 5% inflation. I want a wage hike that makes me afford that. I want my 10% wage hike. And that's how you get a persistent inflation problem. So I think it's because we're getting consistently high, not persistently high, consistently high <laughs> uh, headline inflation that that feeds through to Main Street, and that's when you have a real inflation problem. And that is why I think we need to stop being so academic about it and looking at the core, yeah. and we need to start saying what the narrative is. Right. I mean, if you look at the narrative, Apple, with deep pockets, a great supply chain, just can't deliver enough for iPhones because of the chip shortage. I mean, does that permeate through everything if it touches Apple? I think that's right. You know, like I, the biggest <laughs> company in the world, everyone's like, well, iPhones don't even get, you know, aren't in invincible from kind of supply chain issues. And I think that's again when the man in the street kind of goes, oh my God, am I going to be able to get presents this Christmas? And they start buying up more problems, they create more of a backlog, they start bidding up for stuff. Look, it's really, really important that the only way you get an inflation spiral is because everyone believes it's going to be an inflation problem. The way you, everyone believes it is because it hits the man in the street. This has gone beyond analyzing it academically. We need to think about what people in the street, how they react to what the news yeah. stories are, and that's why Apple matters. Well, Mark, in two seconds, should I be Brent. buying Christmas presents now? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, I'm already late. Mark Cudmore there. You, you know what I want for Christmas, Francine? I Let want go? Mark Cudmore to stay. Forever. <laughs> Can you just stay well, on walk our program? In now. Can you stay, yeah. stay there? Santa, please. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm no answer to that one. I'm, I'm dumbstruck. <laughs> okay, as, as is uh, chief spokesperson, he is staying. For more market analysis, you can also check out Mark and his team on MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Well, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lack in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lines in New York. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News on China's exports surged to a new monthly record in September. Strong demand in advance of the holiday shopping season outweighed the effect of power shortages across the country. While well, rising prices also added to the increase, meanwhile, China's imports rose less than expected. Vladimir Putin sees Europe's natural gas crisis as Russia's golden opportunity. The Russian lender wants the European Union to rewrite some of the rules of its gas market after years of ignoring Moscow's concerns. While Russia is also seeking rapid certification of the controversial Nord Stream 2 pipeline to Germany to boost gas deliveries. And Netflix says the South Korean show Squid Game has become its biggest series launch ever. The dystopian drama has wow. attracted 111 million views since its release September 17th. That surpassed Netflix's pre previous top show, Bridgerton, which hit 82 million households in its first 28 days of release. Some of us like it, some of us don't. Michael Burry's a profitable bets against the housing bubble were immortalized in the big short. Now the doctor turned investor has gone on a Twitter rant against taxes while Burry denounced what he calls U.S. class warfare, and he challenged the notion that the rich don't pay enough taxes. I mean, I guess some people say it's quite refreshing after many billionaires, uh, you know, came through saying that they want to pay more taxes. I'm thinking, of course, of, of Warren Buffett. Well, he's welcome to pay more taxes. There's no law saying that he has to pay the bare minimum. He can write a much bigger check anytime he likes. And um, look, I think regardless of which side of the argument you're on, 
um, a lot of people feel like the U.S. tax system is flawed. The code is like 50,000 pages long. Hmm. Nobody understands it. And it could be simplified were it not for people who work in Washington. Well, and Matt, we know President Biden continues to repeat the refrain that the rich should pay their fair share. I guess the question is, what exactly is the fair share? It seems like that's relative, Francine. Yeah, maybe we'll talk also about that 50% tax deal worldwide. Coming up next, Trevor Greetham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lachlan London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Katie Lines in New York. Matt, the focus firmly on inflation, although it probably won't account for some of the energy prices, as our Mark Cudmore was saying, because it's backward looking and the focus, of course, on earnings. Well, and we never got to touch on Squid Game. I just want to point out <laughs> that I think a lot of people have watched this program. It's quite good, in my personal opinion, I'll editorialize a little bit here. Um, at the start, and then it becomes so bleak and dark and depressing and dystopian that um, it just left me feeling really bad at the end. I, I feel I like a I lot of people would agree. The markets. Yeah. No, Did you true. watch the a lot whole of, thing? You, you know what? I didn't watch the whole thing. A lot of customers, I mean, a lot of, of, you know, viewers actually watch it, like, through their hands. Uh, a little bit gory, and, you know, they're kind of, like, watching it like this, saying, I'm enjoying it. But also, it's very, very gory. But it, it's a stellar, stellar program for Netflix, Kaylee. Yeah, and what's interesting is Netflix can do this, but our Tara LaChapelle of Bloomberg Opinion has pointed out that this is something that Disney Plus could never do because it's family-oriented and that kind of shock factor and gore just doesn't work. So it really goes to the competition between the different streaming platforms and the content that they can put out there into the world. But I'm going to get us back on track, talk about the markets. We do have CPI data and J.P. Morgan earnings today. Going to be a big day and ahead of those potential catalysts. We are seeing stocks right around session highs in Europe. The stock 600 now higher by about half of 1% after being a negative territory earlier in the session. And when it comes to S&P 500 futures, they too are in positive territory, up about two tenths of 1%. In the bond market, we are coming lower on the U.S. 10-year yield. We're just under 1.56% at the moment. And crude oil is off of session low, still though down about a third of a percent. We hold north of $80 a barrel. Now, as for some individual company stories we're watching today, the big one really is Apple after that Bloomberg report after the bell yesterday that it is looking to potentially cut its iPhone 13 production target for the year thanks to the semiconductor shortage. So as a result, Apple is down about six tenths of 1%. You're seeing some suppliers like Skywork Solutions under pressure as well. It's down about two and a half percent. And this is a quick check on JP Morgan ahead of its report at 7 a.m. Eastern time, right now down about a tenth of 1%. But then an hour and a half later, is really the big inflation print we get today. The CPI data will be out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. What kind of pressures will we see from rising energy prices? And what does that mean for the outlook for monetary policy? Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, joins us now for more. So, Mike, give us the down low. Well, Casey, it's very easy to, to explain the CPI report today in terms of this chart here, because this is the white line CPI, the yellow line CPI core. And the question is, is it going to be this or is it going to be this? We saw in uh, August that CPI slowed. It still rose, but it slowed. And the question is, does that suggest transitory going forward? Now, the, this is inflation that's too low. This is inflation that's too high. So the Fed gets their average. And yesterday, the vice chairman, Richard Clarida, said we have more than met the inflation mandate in order to be able to start tapering. So if we get a little bit of a decline or even flat, which is what's forecast today, 5.3% on a year-over-year -year basis for the headline and 4% uh, for the core, then it's going to be for Wall Street, all systems go for a taper in November. The other question is this one. Do we see these uh, particular items go continue to go down? These were the transitory ones that the Fed has been talking about, used cars, car rental, airfares, hotels, motels. Keep an eye on the white line. That's used cars. They were going down, as you can see, and they've started to go back up again. What is the persistence oh. of inflation? We'll be looking at that. I've got a few used cars to sell, so I hope that line um, <laughs> continues to head north. I wanted to get your take on stagflation, uh, Mike. You know, transitory seems to be the word of yesterday, and stagflation is the one on everyone's lips today. What's your take? 
I don't think we're going to see stagflation. Rich Clarida asked about it yesterday. So this is not the 1970s. We are seeing more inflation. There is a feeling among most economists that inflation will back off. But the most important side of this is the stag. We are still seeing a lot of growth. This quarter, not good. But for the year, we're going to come in about 6%. Next year, the forecast is over 5%. That's not stagflation. <laughs> stagflation would be if we were growing about 1%. I might mention, though, food. Keep an eye on food costs. Today, uh, Foshan Haitian, which is China's largest soy sauce maker, said they were raising prices. So your Chinese food may cost more. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. Our Michael McKee there with the very latest on inflation, including food. I know coffee prices went up some 20% worldwide. Now, joining us to talk about all of this is Trevor Greetham, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Trevor, thank you for joining us. If you look at uh, some of the wage pressures, if you look at inflation in food and elsewhere, how can this be transitory? Well, in the long run, everything's transitory. <laughs> Um, the problem is that it's, this inflation is sticking around for longer than people were expecting. And partly that is uh, the supply shortages we're seeing. It's um, some of the underinvestment in commodity industries means you're hitting, hitting some spikes in things like natural gas and Chinese coal. So you've definitely got a lot of um, extra inflation pressures at the moment. Um, next year, you'd expect inflation to come down a little bit. But at the moment, the, the markets are focused on this unfortunate combination of inflation that's high and, if anything, rising, and growth, which is slowing down. So take a bit of exception and the idea that growth is, 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 is clearly a strong story at the moment, because the reopening has caused this massive growth. And now we're waiting to see what the next trend is, and we don't know yet. We're more optimistic about U.S. growth mm. than we are about European growth or Chinese growth. In that, so, in Trevor. That but at the moment, in our so, investment clock, we are in stagflation. We've got inflation rising. Right. Growth is slowing. So, Trevor, what does it mean for actually your asset allocation? What are you buying right now? Well, all year we've been most overweight commodities, um, most underweight government bonds. Uh, regionally, we're tilted away from emerging markets in China. We think the property slowdown carries on, so we're overweight the US, the UK market, which has some inflation uh, resilience, and also Japan, which tends to do well when US Treasury yields are rising, because you get a weak yen, and that helps the Japanese exporters. Um, then within sectors, it's financials and energy. So we've got that value tilt on. Recently, we've taken some profits in some of those positions, um, and we've gone from a neutral position in equities at the market high to a small to moderate overweight, because our investor sentiment measures do show quite a lot of panic. And we think that although we've got this, this slightly difficult macro environment to get through over the next few months, there will be an opportunity to buy shares ahead of 2022, which should be a better year, particularly in the US. But we just don't know how long this workout period is, where the market is so soggy. We, we're, we're buying the dips and, and selling the rallies for the time being. Do you worry about hedging against inflation, Trevor? And, and, and if you... If, if clients want to do that to some extent in their portfolios, what do you recommend? Well, we recommend they invest with us. Um, the um, <laughs> yes. Joking aside, um, we, we've had a bit of a, a, a sort of a, a crusade against the oversimplified balanced funds. So 60-40 funds, 60 global equities, 40 mm -hmm. um, aggregate investment grade bonds, very sensitive to rising interest rates. It did really well in 2020 because tech went through the roof and bond yields dropped. But you're really exposed in a balanced fund. You need much more diversification. So we've got UK commercial property that's heading for a 12% return this year. We've got commodities that in sterling terms are up about 20% this year. We have a bigger allocation to UK equities than the market cap weighting. And that gives you extra inflation resilience because of the sectoral makeup. So yeah, you can... Yeah get a more resilient portfolio to inflation, but a 60-40 balance fund doesn't do it for you. Yeah, Trevor, you're echoing what Bank of America has said recently, calling for the end of 60-40 because we're seeing both stocks and bonds falling now in tandem. We also have JP Morgan earnings coming up aside from the CPI print uh, later on this morning. If earnings do not surprise materially to the upside, what does that mean for the equity market in the end of the year? Well, uh, I think you're going to see some, some gradual disappointment on earnings and also some downward guidance. And that's part of the reason why I think we're in this, this sort of more turbulent, soggy period for markets. Because if you look at economic surprises, they've already turned negative because the big reopening trade has, has matured. And now you've got the sort of steadier growth profile. So 
economic surprises are negative, and I think we'll see earning surprises negative and some, some negative guidance as well. Uh, but beyond that, um, I'm expecting higher long-end yields, and that will benefit net interest margins at banks. But I still think U.S. banks are, 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 are an overweight sector. Trevor, thanks so much. Trevor Greetham there, head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Now, coming up, JP Morgan kicks off U.S. bank earnings today, so we'll get more exactly on what we should be expecting. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, Fatih B. Roll, International Energy Agency Executive Director. This is Bloomberg. Do I see persistence in inflation? Yes. Um, there's, you know, I do. I believe it's more than transitory related to supply chain issues and commodity prices. Hopefully it will straighten out over the next six months. Uh, history would show it should. If the supply chain holds people back from certain goods, they find other places to spend it. People are very, very confident that, uh, you know, they are transitory, that they will be solved. And whether it's three months, six months, nine months, I don't know. Um, I don't think it'll, personally, I don't think it'll be longer than that. So, um, I, you know, I am confident that we will get past this. That was various bank CEOs weighing in on global supply chain issues. They spoke from the Inter Institute of International Finance's annual meeting yesterday. And speaking of banks, let's get more on the earnings this week, which of course kick off with JP Morgan later on this morning. Allison Williams, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Global Banks and Asset Managers Analyst joins us now. So Allison, the story for most of the pandemic has been that the investment bank drives everything and loan growth has been very hard to find. Did that change in the third quarter? We'll see, and I think that is the number one question. Uh, normally, there are certain things that we track throughout the quarter. Um, we do look at Federal Reserve data, but it's, uh, the picture's been a little bit clouded for a couple of key loan categories. So the number one for J.P. Morgan today is going to be what's happening with card. So if you look at credit card loans and if you look at the aggregate numbers, balances are improving and loans are growing. But what we've heard over the last couple of calls is that a lot of that is not necessarily interest earning. So if you spend money on your credit card and you pay it back, you're not paying interest. That's not contributing to uh, the bank's net interest income. And so what we heard from J.P. Morgan in September was that um, a lot of the, the higher payments, the elevated payments, had come down and things were stabilizing. So we weren't yet calling it an inflection or they weren't calling it an inflection yet but things stabilizing. However, from Citigroup, we heard those payments are still a little bit elevated. So we're going to want to see um, if we're getting loan growth. Um, and again, the key is really not this quarter. The key is the outlook for next year. And so the, the banks and the industry in general has been looking for loan growth to improve coming into the back half. And mm -hmm. so that's guidance has gotten a little bit weaker. Some of the trends yeah. have gotten a little bit weaker. So, there's there's still been a little optimism, but I think people need a little bit more uh, to keep that optimism. Yeah, so forward guidance going to be really, really key in the commentary, at least on the conference call. When it comes to trading, you mentioned we heard from JP Morgan in September. They also said it's going to be down, but maybe not quite as hard as we expected. What exact numbers are you expecting to see? So in general, we're expecting trading overall to be about down 10%. Um, we do think there could be some upside on the equity side of things. Mm -hmm. So the positive side for equities has been um, the very strong initial public offerings that we've seen. So obviously when there's I IPO strength, that leads to a lot of secondary trading activity. So we do expect some modest growth there across the banks. The key story, of course, is going to be market share. Uh, right. We had Credit Suisse uh, pull back in, in the prime brokerage business. We think Bank of America and Citigroup are trying to come in as well as other competitors and gain some share there. Fixed income trading, on the other hand, should be down, you know, probably 15 to 20 percent. Mm. Again, we're talking about versus a very strong year last year, and I think the positive news for the banks is the fact that uh, yeah. revenue is better than it was in 2019. So <laughs> worse than last year, but Allison. still better, but still better longer term. Alison, our, our front cover star for Bloomberg Business Week is Jane Fraser of Citigroup. Now, she, in an interview with Bloomberg, she says a lot of the U.S. models are actually broker-driven, which she says will be obliterated in the years ahead. Like, if you look at all the U.S. banks, how will they change in the next five years? 
Well, technology is going to be the biggest uh, change driver. I don't think uh, I, I'm unique in that view, but I think that is going to be, um, you know, where I think a lot of the, the competitive battleground is going to be fought. And so we're well familiar with a lot of the trends on the consumer side of things, uh, right? So I, uh, digital banking, especially during the pandemic, a lot of acceleration in things like mobile deposits and using your phone. But the banks are also doing a lot of things on the institutional side. Those that have invested in the business, uh, like JP Morgan, um, as an example, Goldman Sachs, um, have really leveraged that in their trading business. Bank of America also, um, even yesterday, had an announcement on some of the things that they're doing on the corporate side of things. Uh, and so I think that is going to change. Um, and then for Citigroup, um, as I said earlier, um, you know, one of the opportunities that we so see for them near term is equity trading. But, um, you know, Jane, I think is really reshaping the bank. I think just bringing more visibility to their wealth business, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, they have a very strong Asia presence. And I think, th you know, the move away from, uh, you know, transaction and towards right. fees is something that the banking industry has been, you know, headed towards for a long time. How important is um, the U.S. savings rate? And it's not just the U.S. where we see savings rates uh, stabilize at a higher level than they were pre-pandemic. This must have an effect, Allison, on, on loan demand. And that is, uh, you know, that is the key point um, as some of the conversation we were having earlier in terms of the credit card business. Um, so because of all the stimulus payments, uh, consumers have money and they're paying off their credit card balances through their savings instead of borrowing. So that's a great thing for the consumer. It's, it's great to have a healthy consumer and the consumer is spending. And so all of those metrics are positive. It just leads to a little less on the interest income side. And so um, that has been you know, one of the key implications of all the liquidity, consumers and corporations with a lot of cash. Allison, thank you so much. Allison Williams there of Bloomberg Intelligence looking at the banks. Now stay with Bloomberg TV and radio for full coverage and full analysis as JP Morgan, of course, kicks off the banking earnings parade a little bit later this morning. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lackman, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lyons in New York. Now, the chief executive of Standard Chartered says that his bank is doing a great job of innovating internally, but shareholders won't take into account the value of fintech within big institutions until it starts to show a profit. Well, I caught up with Bill Winters yesterday. I think what we're seeing right now is that the, the, the biggest fintechs are actually happening within banks. Now, they, they get lost in the context of, of the bigger bank, uh, but, but when you look at the, the amount of deal activity or transaction activity, that's going through some of the, the, the very high market value fintechs right now, uh, it's actually quite small relative to the identical, identically digitally driven volumes that are going to happen in banks. Uh, but because they're not very profitable, and we see that from the, the profitability of fintech, I mean, most of them aren't profitable at all, uh, and certainly inside banks, they're no more profitable at this stage, maybe a little bit more profitable if, if we can get to some scale quickly. But, uh, but they're not turning the dial in terms of, of your bottom line operating earnings, and therefore it's not finding its way in, into value. But the relevance to customers is very clear. And uh, it, it starts with the things we all know about, which is small value payments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the fintech industry disrupted small value payments. Banks have quickly caught up, uh, including cross-currency small value payments, so, so remittances and, and, and cross-border payments. And that's, uh, I think banks are, are, are delivering that quite well. The fintechs are super creative, uh, and they're, they're well-funded, extremely creative, and very fast. And don't have the legacy infrastructure that the banks have, and, and probably don't have quite the same regulatory oversight, although our regulators would never acknowledge that. Well, that was part of our exclusive conversation with Standard Charger Chief Executive Bill Winters. Now let's get straight to Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg <coughs> Surveillance. Tom, I know your keen inflation watch. The thing is that with the CPI that's coming out today, it won't necessarily take into account all of the energy crunch we've seen. Well, the energy prices may not be there. It is a busy, busy Wednesday. We're here in Washington, Francine, in the IMF World Bank meetings. They are different meetings after the pandemic. They're definitely, Francine, not back uh, to speed. We've got the bank earnings as well. 
and an inflation report, which dovetails with the re retail report coming out in a few days. This chart explains it all. The suits and ties in Washington, the fancy economists all say inflation's transitory. The reality is the white line and the circle way up top, which is all the agony. Every single person I met, yep. Francine, on the airplane, every single one asked me about inflation. And then you come down to uh, the normal other inflations like the Dallas Trimine and the Cleveland uh, inflation level. And that's where the economists claim we are heading back to. Yeah, it comes from wages. It comes from also from food inflation. Tom Keen there, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joining us from the IMF meetings. I'm excited about your interviews, Tom. Now, here is a look at what else we're watching. Kaylee, all over the J.P. Morgan earnings. Yep, those are coming up around 7 a.m. Eastern time. As we were just discussing with Allison Williams, it's going to be about loan growth predominantly, which has been very hard to find during the pandemic era. And then also, of course, we're looking for trading to decline because of tough comps. And we'll be watching advisory fees as well because deals are really quite hot. The question for me, Matt, is this is a stock up 30% year to date. The banks as a whole up 35%. So how much good news has been priced in? And is that rally going to be f supported by the fundamentals we get today and through the remainder of the week? Yeah, we'll be paying we'll be paying very close attention to that. Um, and I, of course, I'm always paying very close attention to cars. I of woke course. up this morning to a piece in Handelsblatt about the CEO of Volkswagen, Herbert Dies, saying he sees a risk of 30,000 job cuts. Now, what really happened is uh, he told a supervisory board meeting September 24th that that would be one scenario, and we know that building uh, electric cars requires fewer people on the factory floor. Um, and we also know that Deese and Volkswagen are hiring a lot more people to write code, to write software, to develop batteries. So it's not like um, the, 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 the gross cuts would be, or the net cuts would be 30,000, but apparently the supervisory board told him not even think to think about uh, big job cuts like that. And they have an agreement with the, the union. I just thought it was very interesting. It was very interesting. What's also very interesting is the Blue Origin launch. It's a little bit later today. Now, it was initially meant to be yesterday, William but Shatner. it was postponed because of bad weather. Yes, yeah. William Shatner, 90 years old, of course, so the cool. Star Trek star going into space equipped with artwork that Jeff Bezos made to play Star Trek when he was nine years old and the postcard also to inspire the next generation. It'll be quite a fun watch. Yeah, very cool. I can't believe he's 90 years old. He looks great. 90 years old. Yeah, Amazing. going into space. More Bloomberg surveillance up ahead. We'll hear from the IEA director, Fatih Biro, and Joseph Stiglitz, amongst others. This is Bloomberg.